Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's show, uh, tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest. His name is Paul Roberts. He has, uh, like most people my age or around older, uh, he's done a lot of different things in his life, from uh, working with uh, a high-level clearance for the government, doing uh, uh, analysis, uh, intelligence analysis of images, to working for the uh, fish and wildlife area of the government. He has uh, he has a Guinness Book of World Records for dancing 205 hours. He's been into comic books, uh, like most of us uh, have been. Uh, he is um, co-owner of the Halo Paranormal Investigations Group and has been responsible for 2,500 investigations of paranormal events, uh, and including uh, such things as Area 51, Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Mount Shasta, and many others, and has traveled to 59 countries. Welcome to the show. Paul Dale Roberts. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So, um, let's see if I can get all this straight here. Okay, so, uh, did uh, anything interesting happen to you before you started investigating the paranormal? Anything like the paranormal or ETEs or anything odd or unusual? As a small child, I lived in a haunted house. Um, a lot of terrible things were happening to me. I was, uh, uh, the entities were actually focused on me. And there was a time where an entity actually pushed me into a heater. Um, I was enticed by an entity that was mimicking my mother. My mother was in the kitchen, and I'm looking out the bedroom window, my bedroom window, and there was a female voice, which sounded like my mother, trying to entice me to go into the orange grove, and it would say, my, call me by my middle name, Dale. Dale, come here. Dale, come here. If I had gone to that orange grove, God knows what would have happened to me. Um, just terrible things were happening to me in that house. I was so glad to get, finally get out of there. When I got older, I wanted to know... Oh, 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 oh. stop. Stop. Okay, so back up. Let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Uh, uh, like all my guests, you they tend to uh, throw something really juicy out there and then rush off to the next story. So what I'd like you to do is back up for a second and um, first of all, where was your house that was haunted? Okay, it was on Effie Street in Fresno. Fresno, California. Yes. And where is that in California? Is that? It says smack dab in the middle of California. Oh, it's north of LA? Yes. Okay, and uh, let's get into your experience with the paranormal in that house for a little bit before we move on. So um, when you heard the, uh, when the voice was asking you to go into the field, uh, was it something you heard, um, how do I put this, was it using your internal brain uh, voice communication to speak to you, or did you hear a special voice or how did how did you experience that i didn't hear any kind of special voice i just heard a voice that sounded like my mother but did it her voice did her voice sound like it was coming external from you no it sounded like it was coming from the orange grove oh so you heard a voice that sounded like your mother coming what you what you thought was she was in the orange grove and so did it fool you even for a second? No, because I didn't go into the orange grove. 
But I mean, how did you know it wasn't your mother? Because my mother's in the kitchen. So you knew she was in the kitchen? Yes. Okay. So what give us are the, what else happened to you in relation to this thing as a child? Anything else that you can mention? No. That they were just attacking me. Okay, so when you said they were attacking you, besides asking you to go into the orange grove, how else were they attacking you? All right, we are recording. You can uh, answer the question I asked you then if you wish. Okay. Uh, how I got started into the paranormal is when I was a child, I was I lived in a haunted house and everything was centered on me. The entities were actually attacking me. They actually at some point in time threw me into a heater. Um, I went to my bedroom window and I heard a female voice that sounded like my mother saying, Dale, which is my middle name, Dale, come here. Dale, come here. And she was trying to entice me to go into the orange grove. And my mother was actually in the kitchen. So if I actually went into the orange grove, God knows what could have happened to me. Uh, I, I don't even want to even think about it. You know, it's just, it was crazy. Um, I was seeing, I, I was seeing these like these skulls that had wings that would fly into my room. And when I start when I got older, I started wondering if those were childhood nightmares or what I was seeing was something really true. And in that house, one of the weirdest things was I heard like these rolling wheels going down the sidewalk. And my window opened up halfway. And this thing that looked like a black tea kettle with a snout pointed towards me and this mist came out. And the next day I was very, very, very sick. And the next day after that, I was coughing and hacking and my mother came in and actually gave me a tablespoon of poison. And she thought it was cough syrup and she made me vomit this out and everything else. So I was very traumatized. I had PTSD because of that house. And as I got older, I started reading all these books on the paranormal. I, I wanted to know if those were childhood nightmares or if I really witnessed something paranormal. And that's how I became very interested in the paranormal. Did you ever figure out which poison she gave you? Uh, no, it, it, I don't know what kind of poison she gave me, but um, it was back in, uh, gosh, uh, what year was that? Probably 1960 or something like that. And there was a little, you know, skull and bones on the, 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 uh, the bottle. So it was definitely poison. Well, why do you figure you you didn't die? I I was really fortunate because she kept on putting her finger in my mouth and making me vomit and stuff. So it all came out. Ah, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So um, I generally like to have my uh, <clears throat> the people I'm interviewing go through their experiences chronologically. But uh, it's not an absolute requirement. If you want to go through all of your personal events chronologically until we're done with them, or, I mean, honestly, you've done so much in your life as far as investigations go, we could skip past your own stuff and go straight into the investigations, but I'm not uh, tied going either way. I, I would say uh, talk about the most interesting things you are aware of. Now, they could be something you went through or something somebody else went through, or it could go through your personal stuff chronologically. Whatever is your preference, uh, you go for it. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to tell you when I got into the service, uh, I was in the Army from 1973 to 1976 and 1979 to 1986. And from 1973 to 1976, I was an MP military policeman, but I was recruited to work undercover narcotics with the Drug Suppression Team Criminal Investigation Division. And I traveled throughout Germany buying drugs and testifying at Article 32s and court martials. And that's where my investigative skills came in to become a paranormal investigator, not knowing that I ever was going to become a paranormal investigator, but that helped me towards that goal that I didn't even know I had. Uh, 1979, something very interesting happened to me. Um, when I got into military intelligence, I used to always think, I said, if anybody knows about UFOs, it would be military intelligence. So I became a 97 Bravo intelligence analyst, and I took my schooling at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I had a top secret SBI, special background investigation clearance. And I worked with the photo interpretation center in Korea. I was in Seoul, Korea, Yongsong Barracks. And at PICK, which is Photo Interpretation Center in Korea, on one particular day, six photographs came in. And these six photographs were from reconnaissance satellites and reconnaissance aircraft. And they were pictures of UFOs. And the six photographs, it was like a cigar shape. It was a boomerang shape photograph. There was something that looked like a globe, something that looked like ball lightning, something that was triangular, and was something that was a cube. And on the back of these photographs, it said intelligent movement. And they were part of a bigger picture. It was a picture. This, these pictures represented videos. And somewhere out there was videos, but I didn't see those. And my job was very simple was simply to give it a number and pass it on to the DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, and they passed it on to the CIA. And from there, it went into a black hole, and I don't know what happened to those photographs. But at that point in time, I knew that military intelligence was actually investigating UFOs or UAPs, whatever you want to call it, because I saw those six photographs that came in. Can, so, I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, so um, have you ever seen those photos uh, as classified material ever released to the public? I have never seen them released in public. Um, they were definitely classified. Um, I've actually wrote about this. I've talked about it. And I never was arrested because if military intelligence or uh, some counterintelligent agent were to arrest me for something, it would like being an omission that what I'm saying is true. Sure. So uh, you've tweaked my interest more than I expected. So. Uh, you go right ahead. I'll let you, since you, you seem to know how to get to interesting points in your life very quickly, I'll let you uh, remain in control and go in any direction you like. <laughs> um, well, nowadays, uh, you know, I'm still interested in UFOs and UAPs and everything else. Um, what is very interesting is that in my life, we have a psychic medium named Wishfire. And as a child in Auburn, California, she feels like she was abducted by a UFO. And after the abduction, she was able to see ghosts. And there was a situation where we're driving down the street and she tells me, and she goes, Paul, she goes, pull into this parking lot. I go, why? She goes, just pull into the parking lot. 
She goes, there's something in the sky over there. Well, I'm looking in the sky and I don't see anything. She doesn't see anything, but she pulls her camera. She takes a picture and that picture shows three UFOs disc shaped glowing. And there was the, all three of them were glowing and it was in that photograph. And that photograph went viral and 14 times actually published it. And she's had other experiences. Uh, and there was another time when I was with her, we were going through Copperopolis, which is a little town. And she goes again, she goes, there's something in the sky. She snaps a photo and it looks like a doorway or it looks like a portal in the sky. So it was just totally amazing. And we still have, we just recently, Charles, did a all night ghost hunt, UFO hunt. And we did that in Natomas. And one of our guys, uh, Zandine uh, Smith, he's a uh, uh, local ufologist. He was able to capture something in the sky. And UFOs are usually seen during a solar, after a solar <coughs> eclipse. And on that day, October 14th, Saturday, we just had that solar eclipse. And they said that UFOs usually appear in the sky. And it seems like he caught something on his video. Um, the other people, they were busy doing their little ghost hunt at Banning Creek. And the reason why Banning Creek is haunted is because a lot of the homeless used to stay out at the creek. And some actually died at the creek. Some people died away from the creek, but their spirits were drawn back to Banning Creek because it was a place, a community that they were happy at. So, and they were getting EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon and stuff like that. So uh, we still, well, I'm a 14 investigator. So I investigate ghosts, demons, cryptids and UFOs. So um, first of all, what state are you talking about? Uh, California. Okay, and second, uh, how much do I have to pay you to get your friend on my show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now she doesn't do any shows. She doesn't do public. No, no. Darn. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would certainly be nice. It sounds like she's perfect. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let me get something real quick here. Yeah, so we get, uh, I've been on 2,500 investigations. So I've, I've seen a lot, done a lot with those investigations. I, um, uh, we did a Bigfoot hunt over in Mount Chasta. Did you see any? Um, did I see Bigfoot? That time, did you see it that time? Oh, no. W when we went to Mount Chasta, uh, we spent the whole night there and we did a wood on wood type communication because Bigfoot is known for that. Right. And I took a piece of wood, hit the tree three times, nothing. Hit the tree three more times. And then right behind me in the creek, you can hear three rocks hit the creek. And a bear doesn't have the capability of throwing a rock right and there was no other people around me except my two investigators who were right next to me and i would have known if they threw some rocks in the creek so i actually feel that a bigfoot was probably trying to communicate with me when i hit the tree three times and it threw in rocks three different times so we 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 experienced that and so, so what was the location again? Uh, Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta, okay. Yeah, yeah. very mystical mountain. Uh, supposedly the last of the Lemurians live there in the caverns. Um, Bigfoot is seen out there. UFOs are seen out there. UFOs are seen going into the mountain, coming out of the mountain. Uh, ghosts are seen there because they had um, uh, 
Native Americans fighting settlers out there. Sure. So there was a lot of deaths out there. It, it was Mount Shasta is a very active place. Um, so what, so where where's where's the most strange place you investigated? Is it is it uh, is it uh, Skinwalker Ranch or have you investigated something even more strange than that? Uh, Skinwalker Ranch, Area Fifty One. As a Skinwalker Ranch, I brought two investigators with me. And what was kind of interesting is at that time, I was a new paranormal investigator. So I was learning the ropes. And I was at one of the meetings and they were talking about, they said, I would love to investigate Skinwalker Ranch. And I said, well, shoot, let's just do it. Let's get in the car and drive over there. And so two investigators went with me. I drove to the area of Skinwalker Ranch, not the actual ranch, but the actual valley where the ranch is at. And the whole valley is mystical. Right. All kinds of sure. things happen there. Sure. And as we got there, there was this huge storm. And we we're trying to set up our tents and everything. And I was falling into the mud and it was really crazy it was a lot of chaos and but i did see something that was just really incredible uh it's during that storm it seemed like the clouds were like opening up and there's this ball of lightning and it came shooting down and just broke up into all kinds of sparks so it's a natural phenomenon, but very rare, but it was something that I saw. And we also too heard this strange shrieking sound and I tried to record it, but all you could hear was the pitter patter of the rain. Um, the next day, one of the investigator had pneumonia and she was deathly sick. So we, it was supposed to, we were supposed to be there for seven days, but we will wind up just doing one night and we had to drive back home because she was so ill. So, and then she was hospitalized, but she got better and everything else. So, but it was kind of disappointing that we couldn't stay our whole seven days at Skinwalker Ranch. So you've never encountered a Skinwalker, have you? No, no. Have you ever seen a Bigfoot? No, but um, I'm retired now from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I've actually talked to hunters and fishermen who claim that they've seen Bigfoot. Um, one hunter had a very unusual story. He told me that his friend actually shot at Bigfoot and that Bigfoot exploded into sparks. And if that was true, that means that Bigfoot is an interdimensional type being. Sure. That he can go from matter to energy, energy into matter. Sure. Probably can go from his reality into our reality and back to his reality. And that's why we don't find any type of evidence of Bigfoot because it's a matter that can a matter being that can change into an energy being. Yeah, there's a there's a couple I know. I used to talk to them quite a bit. They live in uh, northern Oregon, I think. And I I was trying to encourage them to write a book, but they said what we're not going to write a book. Uh, we'd rather commune with Bigfoot. And I was like, okay, whatever. I mean, they, he uh, comes in their house and everything, but it's not, they're not seeing it. It's, it's invisible when it's moving around. And a lot of people say that it can be, it can move, be standing right next to you and be invisible. And other people say that it, uh, it you know, they are looking straight at it when it disappears, you know, and I've seen ghosts do that. Or once I saw a ghost fairly close to where I live now, it disappeared right in front of me. 
and it was real for there for a moment. But uh, anyway, um, back to you. So, um, so uh, where do we Charles, go? Can I, Charles, can I ask you something? So when you saw the ghost, that was the first time you ever saw a ghost? Oh, no, I've seen them many times. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably the most paranormally plagued person you'll ever meet. Oh, okay. Uh, I used to, uh, how do I put this? When I was uh, living in Houston, I had this apartment long before I met my wife, and I was unemployed. I was laying on my bed, and uh, the lights were all shut off in the apartment. And uh, but the even though the blinds were closed, it's broad daylight and there's a lot of sunshine outside. So there was plenty of light inside, but it was subdued lighting, but good enough. And so I would walk, I would get up out of the bed and walk into the restroom and start urinating. And I would look up at the mirror and I would see something, um, some energy form uh, changing shape in the mirror. And I knew it was behind me, so I turned around. I turned around my, my head. I'm still peeing, right? And so I can't move my lower body. I turn around, I look in the uh, doorway, and it's standing in the doorway. But it's not really wow. standing, it's hovering. And it's uh, not like you would think about a ghost. It was, you know, people think about ghosts, they think of a static object that maybe is see-through or whatever. But this was an energy, you know, I don't honestly don't know to this day if it was a ghost or a demon. So mm. I just know I didn't, I wasn't afraid. It was an inner, it looked like uh, a cloud that was uh, very apparent, but very see-through, but, you know, like barely there, but very obvious at the same time. And uh, it was like, it wasn't as, as solid as actual cloud, uh, like smoke from a from a cigarette or something. It wasn't that solid. It was less solid than that, but very, very obvious. And it would, uh, I, day after day, I would go to the restroom and it would show up in that doorway, day after day after day. And so that's just one of my, you know, if you, if we, if I start talking about my experiences, we'll be here all night and we don't want to, I've already done, uh, plenty of interviews. I don't want to do one here. So I want to hear your stuff. So uh, have you ever encountered an alien yourself directly? Uh, no, um, I never have. But I've actually interviewed uh, various people who've been abducted who have encountered aliens. Well, if any of those people ever want to go public, you've got my number. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so um, have you seen anything in the sky? A craft? Oh, um, yes, I have. Um, in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, uh, 1974, I was in the Army. And uh, I was with two GI soldiers. And we were in the town of Columbia. And we're walking down the street and we look up in the sky and we saw six uh, glowing disc UFOs in formation, like geese formation in V. It was a, a, like a V formation. And one of the soldiers says, geese? I go, that's not geese. I mean, it's glowing, it's glowing blue and they're disc-shaped, and they're in V formation. And we're watching this, and then all of a sudden, they just took off erratically in different uh, uh, directions. And we knew at that point in time, those were UFOs. And then in 1976... Hold on, hold on, hold on stop. Okay. Back up. What, what year are you with the military? What year... What were you doing and where was the location? Okay, 1974, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And that's when I saw the UFOs in B formation. And what, what were you doing when you were with the military 
and you saw the UFOs, what were you doing that day? What were you in the middle of? Oh, uh, we're just going into the town of Columbia and sightseeing. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Go on with what you were going to say. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So um, in 1976, when I got out of the Army, I was dating a lady named Helen Lane. And I was living with her uh, in Sacramento, California. And one day while I was watching TV, uh, she comes running into the apartment and she goes, Paul, Paul, there was a, a UFO. It was 200 feet above me and it was just hovering. And she's like hysterical and she's even crying. And I looked at Helen and I go, come on, Helen, are you telling me the truth? And she goes, yes, yes. And I said, okay, I said, let's contact the police. So I contacted, I got her in the car and we got to Sacramento Sheriff's Department and she told her story and then they gave her a business card and they said, call this number. And it was a toll free number to the Center of UFO Studies in Chicago, Illinois. And she told her story. And about two weeks later, we broke up. And I get a call from a Dr. Alan Hynek. Oh, really? Oh, yes. The man yes. himself. Yes. And he says, I need to talk to Helen Wing because I didn't see the UFO. And he, and he goes, I need to talk to Helen Lang. And I go, Dr. Heineck, I said, I broke up with her. I don't even, I'm not even in contact with her anymore. He goes, what? He goes, oh, okay. He goes, did you see the UFO? I said, no. He goes, what were you doing at the time? I said, I was watching TV. In fact, I could tell you what I was watching. I was watching the comic with Dick Van Dyke. And he goes, did anything happen? I said, yeah, the telephone went, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the TV went into a, the blink. It went into static mode. Really? And he goes, really? He goes, he goes, that usually happens if there's a UFO nearby. Um, car engines will stall. Sure. TVs, radios will go static. I said, really? I didn't know at that time. And... He goes, yeah. He goes, did uh, Helen explain to you what the UFO looked like? I said, well, she even drew a picture for me. He says, do you have that picture? I said, yes, I do. I have the drawing. He goes, can you mail it to me? I go, yeah, sure. So I mailed it to him. And in the Sacramento Bee, the newspaper, it said that Helen Lang and two other people in two different places in Sacramento saw the UFO. So that told me right there that Helen Lang was not lying. She really did see UFO because two other people in Sacramento on that same night saw the same UFO. I don't I don't see how you could doubt her. She was crying, right? How can you yeah. can't, you can't just uh make yourself cry easily unless you got Well, listen. yeah, and and Helen Lane, though, she knew my UFO story from 1974. So I thought I thought for sure she was like, uh, you know, really putting on a good act. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, I was very uh, – I was different when I was younger. I was well, different. I was she, would have to be, different. she would have to be an extremely good actor to, to uh, you know, to cry and everything. I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, I always thought she was a good actress. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I shouldn't have been such a skeptic at that time. But, well, the, yeah. I, I could have been a very good actor. I uh, The day after my father died, I acquired a job. I went in to an interview and got the job the day after my father died. So you got to understand I was really pretty depressed. But there's no way I was going to show that to the person being interviewed. I, I put on a very positive attitude, even though my mind was just very extremely down. 
So, you know, it took uh, good acting to be able to do that. You know. So anyway, um, of all the investigations you've done in your life or all the experiences you've had personally, whichever it is, which one have you not talked about that is uh, the most interesting? <clears throat> Well, I went on vacation to Aruba. And the reason why I went to Aruba is because people were saying that they were seeing a spirit of a, of, of a blonde haired woman walking along the beach. And I started wondering if that was Natalie Holloway. So I took a vacation in Aruba, flew over there. And I start talking to people in the nightclubs over in Aruba. And they knew a lot of details of the stories, which now have came out. They actually told me they knew that Joran De, uh, De Slude or whatever his name was, the killer, that his father took Natalie, placed her on his boat, and took her out in the middle of the ocean and dumped her. They already knew that. I even put it in my article, and now they're talking about the father was involved. I already knew that story. It still blows me away. But anyway, a lot of the people from the nightclub, and I told them why I was there, is to see if I could find the ghost of Natalie Holloway. And they showed me the site, the beach area, where Joran killed her. They knew that too. And um, I, so I attempted to get some EVPs and I did it several times, got nothing. And I had a crowd of people and I told them, please, please don't make any kind of noises. And finally, I got an EVP of a woman saying, please help me. And that EVP was actually posted online um some guy was uh i guess he had a podcast or something and he was putting it out to the public but i actually put that stuff in an article saying that Duran's father was involved in it in her killing and it seems like now the police finally are aware of it and put it out to the public that Duran's father the judge did have something to do with Natalie's uh, death. So you say you've investigated demons. Have you ever uh, encountered one or have you ever seen an exorcism? Either one. What, one of my worst demon cases, Charles, and this is going to probably give you a few chills. Um. Uh, this happened in Fresno, California. I was in the area. And I get a phone call on the paranormal hotline. And it's these two ladies that said that they're being visited by a demon around about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And it comes in the shape of a black mass. And, they, and I, at that point in time, Charles, I was a new paranormal investigator. And so I went on my own by myself, which is a bad thing to do. You should always bring another person with you. And I'll show you what, I'll tell sure. you what. Sure. So I get there and this woman, an older woman in her 60s, uh, a grandmother type, and her goddaughter, they live in the same house. So as I was interviewing them, they were saying, yes, this black mass shows up around about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And they said, why don't you stick around and you can actually witness it? And I said, okay. And it was already kind of late at night. And I had my laptop and I'm doing this interview with her. And then they showed me these bite marks that they both had on their necks and on their shoulders. And I started wondering in my head, did they actually get bites from a demon or did they do that to themselves? So I was, you know, kind of wondering about that. Well, during the interview, 
this woman who looks like a nice grandma, her face was actually distorting. The way I was perceiving it, her face was changing. It started looking more hideous. And that was making me a little nervous. And then I asked her, I said, so you tell me you have a lot of nightmares. And she goes, yes. I said, nightmares about what? She goes, of killing men. I go, what? And mind you, Charles, I was the only man there. So now I'm really nervous. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> and she's, I said, how, how, in your nightmares, how are you killing these men? She goes, with a baseball bat. I go, wow. Well, 15 more minutes into the interview, and I look across the way, and I could see the living room. And her goddaughter, with this manacle look on her face, holding a baseball bat and twirling around and around and around with this baseball bat. I go, oh, you know what? And I said, you know what? I said, this is such an interesting story. I need to probably get somebody else over here. Uh, I said, I'll be right back. I'm not gonna go too far, probably a few blocks down the road. And I grabbed my laptop and she goes, you sure you're coming back? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll come back. Got in the car with my laptop. I was so scared. I left my cell phone there and took off. Well, Charles, I'm going to tell you, I'm not afraid of ghosts. I'm not afraid of demons. But I'm damn sure afraid of a 30-year-old woman with a baseball bat. <laughs> uh Okay, so yeah, that's that's a good story. I uh, you've you've done pretty good so far. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So you've never you never seen an exorcism, have you? No, I, no, I well, I've done well, one. You have? I have. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was, um, but it was a it wasn't like it wasn't like a church exorcism. It was. Um, through hypnotherapy, uh, the the guy came to me. Have you ever heard of a woman named Shakuntala Modi? No. She wrote a book called Remarkable Healings, and the book is basically a series of conversations between her and the demons inside of her clients. And um, basically, each chapter starts off with. Uh, a list of symptoms of that particular client. And then she has the conversation with the demon. And the next chapter uh, starts out with all the symptoms that they had, all the symptoms that uh, went away and all the symptoms that remain. And then another conversation with that same client. And it goes on and on from chapter to chapter. So this guy uh, in question uh, had had gotten two, a couple of copies of her book and uh, was looking for a hypnotherapist to do what she does and on him. And he found my, um, he found one of my cards stuck on a bulletin board somewhere and called me and said, I want you to read, do you know about this lady's technique? I said, I didn't at the time. I said, no. And, uh, or maybe I did, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, he said, I, I've got a copy of her book. I'll send it to you, read it. And when you're through with it, we'll, we'll do the a session. I got right. like a quarter of the way through her book and he calls me up and says, I can't wait. I want you to do it now. <laughs> so, uh, he comes over to my house. So I need to back up. So what happened was he found out about a book that, he claimed uh, every single person who read the book committed suicide, killed themselves. So it was a book about how to manifest things on earth through whatever means. And uh, so he read the book and then he got in this very negative state of mind. He said he couldn't get out of it. And that's how he, uh, what I just told you, all that stu stuff transpired. So he came over uh, in my apartment at the time. It was fairly dark in the apartment itself. 
and when he walked in, he looked uh, he looked totally black from head to toe as far as all the color. He had no there was no colors anywhere in his clothing or anything. And he sat down. We had a session, and um, and after it was over, I was looking. I was on his right side, and after it was over, uh, he said that the left side of his face was contorting, but I couldn't see it because it was on. I was on the right side, which wasn't contorting, and so uh, nothing. Nothing of any note happened in the first session, and then he he paid me, and then he came back a second time, and during the second session, he said he would. Um, we went through the whole uh, scenario or the whole thing, but uh, what happened was he saw a uh, some type of uh, morphing energy thing uh, in his head. Uh, and I assume that was the attaching spirit. And then he's right after he saw that, he saw this um, Venus flytrap, and it it came at him, and it ate the uh, morphing energy blob in his head, and then it disappeared. And um, I didn't know if you know he was cured or if it was worked or anything, but he called me days later and said, yeah, it worked. And then he called me weeks later and said that, or maybe months later, he said that um, within a, a week or two after it, the session, he said he started laughing, and he couldn't stop laughing for like a day or two, and uh, and he was he he uh, got more copies of her book, and he started doing her technique on other people, and he said he had to go to ch when he went to churches. He said he couldn't tell the preacher because the preachers would stop him from doing the work that she did and wouldn't let him do it. So he had to approach people behind the backs of the preacher and pull them aside and say, hey, let's do this work. And he would do it on the side and he was getting success. He got more success than I did. And uh, anyway, that's the whole story. But uh, I thought it was worth telling you since you asked. Oh, thank you, Charles. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, so, um, tell me, keep going with your, uh, you can go literally in any direction you want, ghosts, demons, uh, aliens, uh, uh, paranormal, whatever uh, area that you have an interesting story to, it doesn't have to be yours, it can be anybody's, if you have an interesting story to tell, uh, go for it. Okay. Um, I like to go back on Mount Shasta because it was one more incident that we had at Mount Shasta when we did a paranormal investigation over there. Um, Sylvia Brown, which you probably heard of. Of course. Yeah, Sylvia Brown's secretary, Holly DeLotter, was with us. And she was one of our HPI investigators. And... Um, as we were doing the investigation at Mount Chasta, uh, Holly did something very unique. Well, Holly claims that she is psychic, and I, I believe her. Uh, she goes, Paul, take my picture right now because there's something behind me. And again, I, I didn't see nothing out there, and I snap a photo of her, and right behind her is a disc-shaped UFO tilted right behind her you were outside yes we were outside yes and that was just totally amazing how she knew there was something behind her and also to uh, holly del otter we used to go to serial killer uh uh victim sites and we went to the leonard lake charles ing uh serial killer where the cabin was located at um, I can't think of the town right now, but um, that's in California also in, in California. Go ahead. And, and they actually burned down the cabin. And we we were actually smart able people, to, smart people. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> we were able to locate the cabin through Holly DeLotter, who happens to be a psychic medium. Right. 
And um, at this cabin is where um, uh, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng brought their women. They brought women from the bars. Uh, they brought prostitutes over there. Um, they would tie them up, torture them, videotape them as they were being tortured and assaulted. And they found something like, um, um, uh, I think something like 60 videotapes, VHS videotapes of them torturing all these women. Right. And Holly DeLauder, she did the, another uh, psychic thing. And she goes, Paul, take a picture at this area. And I take a picture and there's this mist. It was a tall mist. I would say about five foot four. Ectoplasm? Yeah, it could, yeah, ectoplasm, it could, that's what it could be. Um, but I believe I took a picture of one of the victims who's now a ghost. Right. So it was this height of a five foot four person and it was all misty. So that was kind of unique. So did, did, have you ever worked with uh, people who help other people pass over during your investigations? Oh, sure. Um, as for myself, um, they my nickname is the Demon Warrior. And people who have attachments, I will provide them with a full submersion baptism. And when I first, and that a full submersion baptism is a basic form of exorcism. Sure. And I definitely believe in angels. That there's angels out there trying to protect you, to watch over you and stuff like that. And I pray, I pray for these angels to help this person who has a demonic attachment. And when I first started doing it, I didn't know if I was going to be successful or not, but I said, what the heck? I'm going to give it a shot. And I started getting these phone calls of people who had demonic attachments. And they said, Paul, your baptism worked. Uh, I no longer have this attachment. It's been lifted. So you have done exorcisms. How many have you yeah. done? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exorcism to the, I mean, minor exorcism. Still an I've exorcism. Done, yeah, yeah. I've done... Um, probably maybe a hundred and something baptisms. Um, I also too do a Roman Catholic house blessing. So um, if they ask me to go ahead and bless our house, I do it and I do it with holy water. And so now you have a cross and I go into each room uh, some some of the rooms I do a four winds prayer. Um, um, uh, I send the demon to wherever he came from. I place the cross over each room, and my Roman Catholic house blessings are, uh, I would say, eighty percent successful. There's that twenty percent that are not because. Either the client goes back to whatever they were doing, messing around with the dark arts, uh, enticing, inviting that demon back into the house again. So, but yeah, about 80%. Uh, so, you, so you've done uh, plenty of exorcisms of people through baptism and you've done exorcisms of, of buildings as well. So you're, you are a... Uh, I could say you're a very minor exorcist, but the numbers wouldn't make, you know, even just because it's a minor type of exorcism doesn't make you a minor exorcist. If you're if you're successful hundreds of times, you're a you're a major. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can exercise a dwelling, there's a lot of, I think there are probably a lot of priests who have done exorcisms of people who wouldn't. Uh, would not try to exercise a building because mm -hmm. they have the belief that only people can be exercised, not dwellings. Right. Uh, do go on. Tell us more uh, interesting stories. 
<laughs> um, Charles, have you ever heard of living ghosts? Um, I think I don't think there is a such thing as death, so everything is alive. OK, um, living ghosts and we've actually experienced this in our investigations, but I will, I'll give you a case example. Uh, 1974 in Chicago, Illinois, this couple moved into this house. And around about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, they would see a man manifest and walk over to the couch and over on the couch would manifest a woman. And he would start repeatedly striking her. And then they would just fade away. Well, this happened about three, four times in this house. And on one particular day, they had a block party. And the host of this block party says, yeah, we do this every year. And this is our photo albums of photographs of our block party. And so the lady looks, starts thumbing through it. And she gets to this one picture and she goes, oh my God, she goes, those are the ghosts in my house. And the host looks at the picture and goes, ghosts? What are you talking about? He goes, yeah, they did live in your house. The police were there all the time because they had domestic disputes. They're now divorced. The man, the husband, now lives five blocks down the road and the woman, lives out of state he goes but they're very much alive he goes i'm still communicating with them so how can they be, how can they be ghosts okay so i understand what you're talking about now so the if you uh the journal of paris like oh god what's it called there's a journal that's been around for like 100 years in the united states and 200 years in england the, Journal of Parapsychology, something. It's not, that's not the name of it, but I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But uh, um, it's called, what you're talking about is called, or at least the way they, what they called it, and what it is, is um, an, it's an out of body entity of a living person. So what you're seeing is that person manifesting non-physically in a different location than they are physically at so i've seen that myself and um uh how did it go so um i was coming home uh i was living in houston in my uh either late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. Uh, I was coming home from somewhere. I don't even know where I was coming home from. Uh, but I was um, driving outbound on Memorial Drive and or not outbound. Yeah, outbound away from, away from the city, away from the city center on Memorial Drive. And um, I went, uh, started going around this uh, sort of high bank left hand turn. And I was in a very strange mood. And instead of getting up on the higher end of the bank in my lane on the right side, like we drive here in America, England, they're on the left side. Okay. Instead of doing that, I was driving my Pontiac Le Mans. Um, down the center of the road. So the center of my vehicle was on the yellow line or white line, the intermittent line. I was driving half in my lane and half in the oncoming lane. I just passed Bunker Hill Police Department, which I've been in that jail too. Anyway, I just passed that jail and I was taking this high banked left hand turn. And, um, and wasn't very high banked. It was a little bit high, a little bit high bank, but not not much. Anyway, so I'm taking this left and driving down the center of the of both lanes, not not in my proper lane. And I saw this um, 
it was a two-dimensional human. And a lot of ghosts are two-dimensional. They're, they're not, you can't see through them. They have width and they have height, but they don't have depth. It's like they're on a flat surface, okay? And the ghost I was telling you about a minute ago was like that. So um, anyway, he this guy appeared from the knees up like he was standing in the middle of my hood outside my, over my engine. And he was solid. I couldn't see through him. I had to look around him to see where I was going. And because uh, he had some width there. And and the only, it, looked, it was kind of from a strange angle. I was, um, I was looking at him as if I was, um, as if I was hovering above his head, right in front of him, like like uh, maybe two or three foot in front of him, but above him and looking down on him, okay? And the only thing I could see besides him was a, a intermittent yellow or white line going at a 45 degree angle up into the sky. So I was looking down upon him at the angle I was looking at him. And so I could see him for, uh, I don't know, five or 10 seconds at the most. And uh, and then he disappears. And then I think I start thinking about this really quick. And I'm like, why did I just see a guy walking down the middle of the road? And I'm thinking, well, maybe there's a guy walking down the middle of the road on the other end of this corner, uh, long curve. And uh, so I slow down, I get in, I go up into my lane, uh, fully in my lane. And I come out of this curve, and there's a guy standing right in the middle of the road on the yellow line. And I passed him like I must have missed him by about an inch, two or three inches at the most. And uh, went right past him, and I slammed on my brakes. I looked back. I could see him. I pulled over. I stopped. I kept. I looked back, and I I kept. Seeing him standing there, he was solid, full, real, live human. And I just seen an out of body version of him that was not, not had no three dimensionality. It was only two dimensional. And it was an out of body individual, a living person, just like what you're talking about. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, back to you. Tell me, tell us another interesting story. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was kind of interesting with that case because, uh, yeah, it's residual energy that has been impacted into the atmosphere and replays itself over and over, over again. Uh, so you think that's different? That's different from what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's different, yeah. Um, um, because there's negative energy and even positive energy that will impact the atmosphere and replay itself over and over, so, over again. So you think those people lived in that house at one point? Oh, yeah. The, the, the uh, host actually said that they lived in that house and they had the Okay, so experience. it was residual energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess what I was ta I'm talking about is, uh, as they say, an out-of-body ent entity of a living person. And what you're talking about is residual negative energy in a given location right so you're familiar with um locations where very negative things happen and then it kind of creates kind of a almost like a black hole where all kinds of negative things happen in that one spot if you know what i'm talking about right yes yes have you ever investigated one of those um we have well we did an investigation at Evangeline's, which is a costume shop. And on the third floor, late at night, uh, the employees uh, working at the shop will hear shuffling of feet, feet. They'll hear like disco music. They'll hear people laughing. And it's positive energy because back on the third floor, back in the 1970s, it was a club called Dio Mills. And it was a disco club and that in the same building yeah yeah and so okay. that, that building evangelines which is now a costume shop 
on the third floor, they still hear disco music, people laughing, people dancing, and everything else. So strong, positive energy impacted that atmosphere. So have you, you're familiar with the, uh, the movie The Haunting, right? The, the, is, isn't that the one where uh, St- Stephen King wrote it for the, uh, what's the one with Here's Johnny, that one? Oh, yeah, The Shining. The Shining, I'm sorry. You're familiar with that movie, right? Yes. Have you ever been in that building? No. Okay, I was um, I was hanging out at that. I was taking I was doing some metaphysical work for about a week at the um, at the uh, what's it called the place where that that building is at Estes Park. Okay, I, we went to Estes Park for a week to do a bunch of metaphysical stuff, and I kept walking past that building. And I'd seen The Shining, the movie, and I kept looking at that building going, that building looks awful familiar. And I couldn't, I I did not place it with the movie. And I never did go into the building, but are you familiar with the story that Stephen King wrote? Or not, not wrote, but he, are you familiar with how he came about uh, deciding to write The Shining itself? You familiar with that? Um, no, I'm not. Okay, so what happened was, here's how, here's how I heard it. Now, I'm not saying this is true, but this is what I heard, is that he, he heard how, ha- that, that, he heard the rumors about that building being haunted. So he went to stay in the building himself, and in, he didn't stay in the most haunted room of the, of the building. He just stayed in a particular room. It's got his name on it now, called the, the King or something of that nature. And uh, and he had a really nasty nightmare. And he woke up and wrote the book, which The the Shining, the, uh, that the movie's made on, uh, based upon, the next day, like in, you know, probably before he left. I would, I would guess he wrote it before he left the, uh, the building, but... Uh, that's the story I heard. It, I thought it was an interesting, interesting enough story to tell, retell. Charles, I actually heard something like that. Yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he knew beforehand that the place was haunted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I I think it would be interesting uh, checking out that building one day. Yeah. Um, there's a place, let me see if I can remember what it is. Oh, yeah. Have you ever investigated anything in uh, Virginia? Or is it Virginia? Yeah, Virginia, Virginia, Virginia. I gotta think. It's Virginia. Uh, it's not Virginia. It's Washington. Have you ever investigated anything in Washington State? I, I've been to Seattle, Washington, and I've been to some locations that were where people said that they were haunted. Um, I know I wrote an article about it, but uh, it kind of escapes me right now. I can't I can't really remember what places that I went to. I, um, I know that the tunnels are very haunted in Seattle. And um, I did walk in some of the tunnels, but um, I didn't see anything. I didn't experience anything. But yeah, Seattle is well, the history. The reason why I brought it up is because I had a um, a little adventure. The um, I got. I'm trying to think of the name of the town. It's got an interesting name, but I, I've got it on my website. If anybody wants to know the name of the town, anyway, there was a town in. I'm pretty sure it's Washington State, but I could be wrong. Uh, it. Um, Maybe you've heard this story. The there's a uh, you know what a snow shed is? A, a, a train snow shed? Not really. No. Okay, so um, in if it's Washington State, uh, there's a there's a I should go look at my website, but I don't want to take away from the show. There's a uh, there's a train shed that goes through a mountain. 
it's basically a long tunnel that they must have drilled it with dynamite or something because they didn't have any, any, anything back in the day that would go through a, a mountain other than dynamite. So anyway, they got this. There's a there's a a uh, tunnel that's like a quarter mile to half mile long mm -hmm. or longer going through this mountain. And the the way the story goes, the um, the train was in this in got caught in the tunnel or was snowing outside. So they had the train in the tunnel and the people were starving for three or four days. And uh, they decided to, to, to try to move, keep going. And so they went, pushed ahead on the train, got it like halfway out of the tunnel and they couldn't go any further because the, the train wouldn't push the snow, but it was still running and it was chugging and it caused the, an avalanche, and the avalanche came down, wiped out, uh, killed about like half the people on the train, and and wiped out most of the people in the town below it. And then you've got all these ghosts or, that hang out in this area, and I've got some photos that are orbs at the end of this uh, snow shed. And people, I tell this story, and people are like, that's just a ghost story. That didn't really happen. And I'm like, okay. Go back to the snow shed and look up at the end of the snow shed. You'll see the re you'll see huge masses of concrete that are like four times the size of a human hanging from rebar, where the snow shed uh, decimated the end of the tunnel. So it's not a it's not a, uh, a, a story somebody just made up. So anyway, I just thought I would mention that because. That town, we I went there and it had there's a there's a uh, you could go investigate this if you wanted to. There's a uh, um, a uh, what do you call it? hotel? There's a hotel in that town. The town is dark, right? I mean, as in completely dark, no no uh, power of any kind. So I don't know how this hotel gets power, but it's. Um, it has power. The, top, the the hotel has power, and it's the only thing in the town that has power. Nothing else in that town has power, right? So you can walk around at night. If there's no moon out, you're going to be falling in the ditch. So I was, like, walking around uh, with a, a third-generation night goggles on for an hour, and um, and we're I'm standing behind this uh, investigator who's like you, and this ghost orb comes flying over me all these women the crowd i'm in is like 20 30 women i'm the only guy in the crowd and i'm not i'm psychic but i'm not as psychic as they are and they're looking up going oh there's one oh there's one oh there's one and i'm not seeing squat and so eventually you know i'm at some point i'm standing behind this girl she's got a, a brand new zero lux sony camera video camera it's night vision. It's uh, infrared. And it just came out like the week before. And you see this orb descend in front of this camera, uh, you know, fold out a, a video live. And it starts dancing in a, a figure eight fashion in front of the video camera. Right. So uh, we know that's a ghost. Right. It's too big to be a bug. And it's it's dancing in a figure eight fashion, which bugs don't do. So she, after this was all over, she sent me this uh, a VHS copy of this, of her whole recording for the whole weekend, a whole bunch of ghosts flying past her, uh, her, her lens. But that one figure eight movement was the only really spectacular part of what she recorded. And I took it up. I was working at Microsoft. I took it up to Microsoft. Uh, one day I started talking about ghosts and stuff in front of these people I worked at at Microsoft in their main server building, building 11. And they, all, they think I'm like crazy or making stuff up. They don't believe a word I'm saying. So I said, oh, let me go, well, let me go home and grab my VHS. So I go home and get it. And I have watched this video, VHS tape many, many times. And I've looked at that figure eight movement of that ghost over and over and over, right? 
So I take it up to I take it up to Microsoft. I go upstairs to the second floor. There's a TV, a flat screen TV. It must have cost them somewhere between 10 and 20 grand because it was right when they just came out. It was a big 32 inch or 64 inch flat screen TV. I had a VHS tape player below it. I stick it in the recording. I start it up. I start playing this tape. And guess what? The V8, the, the figure eight movement of that ghost is no longer on the tape. And it's never been edited. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's another way I knew it was paranormal because it's quite common if you record uh, something like a ghost on magnetic media for it to disappear. You probably know that. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting story because, uh, you know, it's ghosts and we're in a ghost tonight. So anyway, back to you. Uh, tell us as many interesting stories as you care to, to uh, elaborate on. <laughs> um, of any kind. Of any kind. Huh? Um, yeah, so uh, living ghosts, we talked about that. Um, um, uh, my my ex-brother-in-law, Robert Mitchell, he served on the USS Nimitz. And the USS Nimitz, a lot of people don't realize, and according to my brother-in-law, is haunted. Um, they had... Um, um, uh, airplane that crashed into the Nimitz and something like 14 servicemen died. And some of the people, including my brother-in-law and some other servicemen, have seen apparitions on the ship. Sure. So one day when that is out of, uh, is decommissioned, that would be a ship I would love to investigate. I've investigated the, um, uh, not the, uh, oh, shoot. I can't even think of what ship I investigated. I lost my memory on it. I don't even know. Um, but yeah, and I'll also tell you that with the USS Nimitz, uh, a serial killer, was actually stationed on there. He was a serviceman named John Eric Armstrong, and he killed five prostitutes in Detroit. Um, and when he was on that ship on a different ports, he may have killed people at different ports. And some servicemen have seen a ghost of a woman. So they, some paranormal enthusiasts wonder if that serial killer one of his victims is on that ship. Maybe so he must have killed her on the ship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? I mean, it's, it's possible. So I wonder how he got her on the ship in the first place. Not that he got her on the ship, but that possibly he killed her and her spirit followed him to back the ship. To the ship. Ah, so, there we go. That that explains it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um. Yeah. So what is, is your brother, you were talking about your brother-in-law? Yeah, uh, it was my brother-in-law, uh, Robert so what, Mitchell. What, what did you say his name a while ago? Robert Mitchell. And what did he do? Uh, he was stationed on USS Nimitz. He never explained what his duties were to me. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, and the ship that I investigate was the USS Hornet. So, yeah. I've heard of the Hornet and the Nimitz. Uh, I wasn't aware of either one of them being haunted, though. Oh, yeah. USS Hornet is very haunted. Yeah. They even did a documentary on it, on my ghost story. So what's the most haunted place you've ever visited? Yeah. Well, with 2,500 investigations, I've seen four full-body apparitions. Um, there was a oh, house. Oh, hold on. Stop. Back mm -hmm. up. All right. Tell us all four. <laughs> Well, yeah, I've seen four full body apparitions. No three one, in, uh, one in Marysville, um, where I saw a woman who drowned in her bathtub. She was an alcoholic, and I saw her appar apparition 
go from one side of the house to the other side of the house. And that was my very first apparition. Hold on, um, stop, back up, back up. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you, did she look solid? Uh, did she look like she was still alive? She looks solid. She looks solid. Okay, go ahead. Go to the next yeah. one. Um, and then in the, the three other apparitions, um, there was just investigations where I saw an apparition. Uh, I saw a full body apparition. I can't recall exactly what cases they were. So, but... so um, in all of these four cases, did they look solid? In all four cases, they look solid. Like just like if the you know it, just like you couldn't tell if they were alive or dead. Exactly. Yeah, you couldn't tell. Okay, go on. Yeah, and then they just dissipated. They okay. just faded away. Tell us more interesting stuff. <laughs> um, okay, there was a case in Del Paso Heights. Oh, how long is this show for anyway? It's as long as you want to make it. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I, I've got a few things I got to do, so um, I'm going to give you this one last story, and then I have to. That's I fine. To really get That's off. fine. Okay. We're good. Okay, okay. So um, we had a case in Del Paso Heights, which is near Sacramento, and in this case, I took a picture in the backyard, and I got a picture of two designer orbs. Designer orbs are orbs that have intricate type designs inside of it. And sometimes you can see faces in the orbs. And orbs can be almost anything. It could be skin flakes. It could be dust. It could be uh, dew drops. It could be light refractions, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. But with these, as I enhance the photographs, you can make out the faces of two dogs. So I went back to the occupant of the house and I said, what is it you have in your backyard? And she goes, um, I have orange trees. And I said, not the orange trees. What else do you have in your backyard? And she goes, I have two dogs buried back there. I go, okay. I said, look at these photographs. So she looks at them and she starts crying. And I said, why are you crying? She goes, those are my two dogs that are buried in the backyard. And something like that, I was able to deem as paranormal because she validated the fact that the faces of her dogs were in those photos. That is a very interesting story. Yeah, yeah. You've done a great job tonight. Uh, you've told a lot of, pretty much every story you've told has been very interesting. Thank well, you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for coming on my show. <laughs> okay. And uh, send me the link when the, the show is completed. I will definitely send you the link, and I'll send you the link to the uh, uh, to the story I wrote up about the investigation I did at the uh, uh, where the people I got killed. So you can go there and investigate that. Oh, by the way. Uh, um, the night I showed up at that event, all the people were gone that were supposed to be there. And I was like, I got there and I'm like, where did everybody go? They're supposed to be here. They had gone into the tunnel, uh, with night, vi the night vision goggles and together they saw, uh, what they think was Bigfoot at the other end of the guitar. They couldn't tell for sure because it was too it was all the way at the other end of the tunnel. So it was so small. You know, they saw the eyes or something, like the eyes were glowing or something. I don't remember exactly how they described it, but uh, they somebody saw Bigfoot. And so it might be a, some place you'd like really like to check out. Anyway, thank you for being on my show. Oh, Charles, wait, hold on for one minute. I, I got some clarification on the USS Nimitz. The, oh, okay. That story. So I'm going to say it one more time. Okay. So my brother-in-law, well, my ex-brother-in-law, Robert Mitchell, he was he served some time on the USS Nimitz. And there was a serial killer named John Eric Armstrong. Right. And 
John Eric Armstrong killed five prostitutes in Detroit and he killed two people in Seattle. And one of them was a trans. Um, well, the ship was docked. Some of the servicemen saw a, an apparition of a female and she looked like she was in distress. And it is believed that the serial killer, John Eric Armstrong, that's one of his victims that probably followed him from a port where he killed her and went back, went on the ship. And they also too see apparitions. They see faces that appear on reflected services. And, and they believe it's from a plane crash that happened on USS Nimitz where 14 people died. And the other thing about the USS Nimitz is an attack nuclear powered warship. And that's where they had the Tic Tac UFO incident where they actually documented this right. UFO sure. from the USS Nimitz. So the USS Nimitz, I'm waiting for the time that is decommissioned and I would love to investigate that. Well, um... Did you ever investigate the, um, what's the one, the real famous one where the lady hacked all her relatives? Oh, the Bo uh, Lizzie, Lizzie Borden. Borden, yeah. Did yes, you go yes, I did that. I, we went to Salem, Massachusetts, and the, with the Lizzie Borden house, we didn't capture any kind of evidence whatsoever. But there's a lot of stories about it. So, the, is it haunted or not? I mean, according to a lot of people, they say it's haunted. Yes. Um, yeah. Those, uh, the serial killer victim sites that I went to was Leonard Lake, Charles Ng. Um, there was cult members from Charles Manson that killed a woman in Stockton. We did that one. Um, we did um, uh, the Vampire of Sacramento, Richard Trenton Chase. Um, yeah, we've did, we did done a lot. Um, Charlene Gallegos. Have you read this one? Have you read this one here? Oh, let me see if I can get it. Oh, yeah. I haven't read that, but Charles Mann's CIA and the Secret History of the 60s. Oh, interesting. Um, I would highly recommend this book. I've um, only gotten a third of the way through it, but the guy spent an enormous amount of time, effort, and money investigating uh, Mr. Manson and his connections with Terry Melcher, uh, Dorstay's son, and the Beach Boys, and, and uh, um, I don't want to get into it now because I know you got stuff to do. But I would, if you're interested in the Manson event and what really happened, why he did it, all that stuff, that's uh, a very good book. I'm, I'll I, to, I suspect I'll definitely try to pick it up. I suspect it's much better. In fact, I know it's much better than Helter Skelter uh, and some of the other books. I've read those as well, but this is much better. The guy really did his due diligence to, to, to gather all the information he did. Uh, well, thank you again for being on the show. Uh, you did an awesome job. Uh, if you ever have a desire to come back, uh, I, with all the investigations you've done, I suspect you could easily do another show. Uh, <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, thanks again. And let me let, let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Okay. Here we go.